when I say narrow, that's like I listen to everything. I read everything. And if I go to a museum, I like to see any kind of art. We are big fan of neighborhood watering holes that serves food. Not like focusing like sometimes just like ancient Egypt, sometimes uh, World War II, sometimes a uh, Cold War era. You walk in, but the first time we walked in, I was just like, is it the place? Because everything was just like whitewashed uh, walls, white cloth, a tablecloth, and wooden, very simple chairs and tables, nothing else. Hello, everybody. I'm so excited for the next up in our uh, whiskey person um, interview series that we're doing here to have my very good friend, Bozzy. He uh, he runs the amazing whiskey website, one of my favorites to actually read myself, which is Tier Bouchon. There will be a link for it below. And also, uh, so just like we did with Chris Udy and the the others that we'll be going through, the, there will be a link for Bozzy's written answers because I sent him all these questions beforehand, and they're on they'll be on the website. But the whole purpose of this is to get to know Bozzy even better, better than the written word, and um, so that will uh, be on there. And you know, as usual, there is going to be a poll on the Patreon account so that you can choose who you want to see in the future in these uh, interviews. But today, today we're going to talk to the man, not really a myth because he's right in front of us, but just a fantastic, fantastic human being in in, in all, Mr. Bozzy. And uh, Bozzy, because I don't want to slaughter your actual full name, could you just go ahead and pronounce it for us? Because I know I've said it wrong literally every time I've known you. <laughs> no, no for the way. entirety that I've known you for, which is, what, six years now? Five years yeah. now? No, it's yeah. more than six, maybe, yeah. Yeah, six or seven. So yeah, what did, say your name for us so that I okay. don't fuck it up. <laughs> my, my real name is Boskurt Karasu. So it's a, Tur- it's a Turkish name. He is from Turkey. Yep. Yeah, and Bazi came up like very early. It's not made for foreigners or after I moved to US or something. Like I had this nickname like forever. So, oh, so it's a childhood nickname. It's teenager. Yeah. Yeah. Teenager? Oh, okay. Yeah. Awesome. I just thought it was like, oh, you're like, oh, Americans won't be able to do this. Let's just say, let's just go by Bazi. It'll be easier. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, uh. Bazi, I am drinking because I know this is one of among your favorite distilleries. So I've got the Glen Scotia. Yeah, the the uh, rum cask finish, which is one that you turned me on to. You actually said, hey, go pick this up. It's really good and it's a really good deal. And because uh, we have a, or just as a background, like Bazi and I and some friends, we have a, a whiskey chain that's constantly going and Bazi will pop <laughs> in with like, hey guys, this is like a crazy good deal that just dropped. And so then we'll go and we'll get it. And this was one that, uh, this is actually my second bottle of it. I opened it fresh just for for tonight because uh, it was one of the first Campbell or one of the first Glen Scotias I've had, and it was the first time that I just kind of so I had like the old ten year I think it was in the mm-hmm. Victoria, and I was like, eh, they're all right, and then this one just completely blew my mind and has such a crazy good rum presence. So this is this is what I'm going to be drinking tonight while while we're talking. Um, Great. Anyway to wet my whistle what about you what do you got over there so funny that we chose two uh campbelltown whiskeys but not campbelltown brands i have a caden hat oh so that's a dalian 13 years old and distilled in 2004 and i was about I was just like working on it. You can see just, <laughs> just a little, so just like, yeah, kill the bottle. Nice. Little damage. So, nice. Yeah. Nice. I, well, I figured going with something from Campbelltown was going to be a safe bet that you would have that as well. Thank you. you. Bozzy is like Mr. Campbelltown. He knows all the folks there and he is, he is quite well versed in the whiskeys that come from there, especially the Springbank distillery and uh, Glen Scotia. So speaking of Bozzy, since I'm looking at your face right now, Let's go ahead and just jump right in. So, sure. um, yeah, there's no delicate way to start into them. But so the first question, it, which is the one, you know, that I sent to you. So we're going to go through the same questionnaire. Um, 
I want to know what is the most memorable drink you've ever had? Uh, toast at a wedding, birth, trip, whatever it is. I want to know what what's something that just sticks out in in Bazi's mind. It's it's funny that like when you first like asked this question written, I just like I didn't have one that came in my mind just like oh that's it like because you said just like toast at a child's wedding, birth or something. I was like I couldn't find something that valuable but there was just like one memory just like popped and i was just like yeah let's use that it was a good night and it i remember this so that makes it memorable yeah you, you've so, hit the requirements <laughs> so like uh, when i in, got interested in whiskey uh i wanted to travel to the city distilleries and that was my first time going to isla in 2009 so I was staying in a BNB at Port Allen, and there was a small pub really close to where I was staying called uh, Art View Inn. So I was going there every night and testing, like tasting all the bottles that I can find on the shelves because they had like all the distilleries there. And so I was going, I was just like two or three drams in, and there was a guy like, on the counter, not even sitting, just like leaning to the counter and started to talk to me. It was a little like older than me. And it was like, yeah, like, why are you here? What are you doing? And I was like, I'm visiting distilleries. And it's just like November, like nobody's on the island. It's cold, raining. It was Thanksgiving break, right? It was my Thanksgiving break. Oh, nice. And then the guy just like was really interested that I'm there, like a, a guy coming from like New York, I was living in New York back then, and with a weird accent coming in November just for visiting distilleries. So he wanted to talk whiskey. And then he was just like, look, I want to buy you a whiskey, but I cannot afford these bottles, what you are drinking. And we like Scottish leader here. And and it has Buna Haven in it. And it was like, yeah, sure. And he wanted to buy me a Scottish leader. He was drinking his. And I saw his actually pint going low and I was like, let me buy you a beer. And there was like tenants. And then I stopped like ordering what I want. His buddies showed up. There was a jukebox there. And I stayed there like till I get filthy drunk on Scottish leader <laughs> and tenant. And I was just like, that was the best night ever, like on Isla. We had so much fun. They were so nice. They wanted to know everything about New York. I wanted to know everything about Isla. And at night, we pop got closed. They made sure that I just like went back to my BNB safe. <laughs> they literally <laughs> woke <nice> me. <laughs> that was so nice. And I always remember that night. It was great. And actually, oh, that also turned me in like to Scottish leader right now. Just like I like that plan. So yeah, we we actually just talked about that on yeah. on, that, on that thread the other day. Is yeah. that you? We, we were talking about blends specific, and you brought up Scottish leader, which I've never had. I had no idea that it was a Bunahaban was a key component of it. I just I've never even heard of Scottish leader. So that's now now like this answer plus that thread now together, it, it, it kind of paints a bigger picture. So why you have a love for Scottish leader? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And now I really need to have some Scottish leader <laughs> tenants. I have had quite a bit of though. Uh, it, it, it's, uh, there's some pubs here in, in SoCal that have it, but then also it's, it's quite popular all throughout London and, and the UK. And, and when yeah. I travel over there, there's tenants everywhere. So I have had that one. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That I'm, I'm so just, I was supposed to go to, uh, me and Raj, we were supposed to go to Scotland yes, for our first yeah. trip. And then it was March of the pandemic when everything got shut down. That was when we were supposed to leave. So I'm I'm jealous because I still have not been. But ah, that is fantastic. And for those out there who don't know, Bazi is um Bazi, because the next question is about your career. Um tell us exactly what you're because I know that you do you you manage like the stage, you do the sound setup, everything for, I always, I always 
not being originally from this area or I, I, not having a school, I always mix up at USC and UCLA. I, so right now at UCLA, yeah, yeah, I'm at UCLA right now. Yeah, UCLA. Okay, I didn't want to. I didn't want to screw that one up. <laughs> so at UCLA, UCLA, uh, tell us exactly what you do for a living. I'm a performing arts production manager. Production manager. There we go. Right now, that's my title, and that's the title that I hold like since 91 many times. But I did do also stage management, sound and video design, and all kind of like different things that's related to the tech side of performing arts. But mainly, yes, I'm a production manager. Awesome. Okay, so now now that we have the full background, and I didn't you know screw up your your title as well. Um, the second question is, what is the most transformative moment of your career as, you know, in, in the technical side of performing arts, which is, you know, where you're at now? So I did start in 91 when I was 19 years old, of course, not as a production manager, actually as a stagehand and in Istanbul festivals when I was living in Istanbul that time. And in 2000. To, uh, I was production managing Istanbul International Theatre Festival and we hosted the Worcester Group. The Worcester Group is a theatre company from New York, which I was a huge fan of. We tried to bring them to Istanbul like many, many years and many times we failed. And that year it worked out. They came and just like performed their show to you to birdie for a week for the festival it was fantastic really successful they went back and after a few months i received an email from them asking me to join the company as their new production manager because the old production manager was leaving and he dropped my name as the new one wow. so so i can i they they flew me to new york we had the job interview and they were like, when can you start? And I was like, when do you want me to start? It was like in three weeks. So I flew back and I was 31 years. Yeah, I was 31 that time, 2003. And I had to shut everything down, like house, everything. And I put everything that I can fit in two duffel bags and moved to New York. Holy cow, that's incredible. And I, and and if, if anyone's familiar with performing arts, I mean the Wooster group, that that's not that's a big deal. Like that that that's I mean that's a hell of a a, a thing to, to go for. I mean that that's 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 a crazy place to to really get your start in in America, like to come and land in. That's incredible. And yeah. I mean Yeah, I was just like I was shell shocked. I couldn't awesome. believe that they were just like offering me the job. Like, I was just like, say it again, what's going on? Like, I read that email like many times and I knew that if I hesitate, it's never going to happen. No, that's so. wow. That is so incredible. And then just that, that quick of a turnaround to like pack up your whole life and move to an entire other country. That's, that's incredible. To, you to, don't, you don't even know what to do at that time. I was like, Oh, wait a minute. What am I going to do with the CDs? Uh, what yeah. am I going to do with the books? Like I tried to, make sure that they're going to in good hands that people who would love mm -hmm. to get them because I didn't have time to sell them or something. Right. So I was just like calling people. Hey, are you interested in this? Are you interested in that? Like, Hey, I know, I know that you were liking my couch. Do you want to come and just like pick it up? Like, <laughs> that's so cool. But I mean, really that it's a good experiment in, uh, in uh, what's important in your life, like what made it into the duffel bag, you know, clothes, obviously, because exactly. You know, yeah. <laughs> but like, when it gets to that point of like, okay, I got to move to another country in three weeks, I can only take X amount, it comes down to, like, it really kind of like, solidifies the things that you 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 really truly want to, you know, have with you in that type of a journey. That's yeah. Was, was there anything specific? Was I mean, the next question, because uh, this is all leading in together with the arts. Um, but was there a book or something? Is there something that you took besides clothes that you're like, this thing has to go with me? Um, when, when you left, was there, was there something that you're you like, this, this needs to go on my journey with me to New York? 
Okay, like just a second, I'm gonna bring the book. There was one book. I I have no idea why I took that book with me, but there was one book that I carried. That's like, <laughs> so I I knew it. I knew this would happen if I if we asked you. All right. I mean, we talk so much about like music and movies and stuff, and that's that was it. That, that's the book you brought with you. Yeah. Oh. Was like I, I don't even know. I had so many theater and design books and stuff, but like somehow I was just like, that's that has to come with me because I was always looking at it, in it for inspiration and stuff. So it's still with me. <laughs> that's amazing. And have, have you have you do you keep referencing it even today? Like get, yeah. getting ideas for when you're putting together productions. Yeah, I mean uh, there are few books uh, that I have like a memory that I know. If I want to refer to something, I know there is a reference, a photograph or a paragraph in that book. So I can go and just like find them. It's not like, yeah, I, I travel with so many books in so many states. It's really painful, but some of them are really like, even the digital copies are not helping me. Like, it's really mm -hmm. nice to have it in front of me. That's amazing. See, I'm, I'm the opposite. I like the digital because I can like, I remember certain things. And then I can actually do like, you know, a control F and go and find it. Cause I'm like, I remember it was somewhere in here, but I can never remember like page or something. So I'm, I'm a bit of the opposite. <laughs> I love the digital cause I like being able to just use the find function. No, I, I have to be like that too. Like it's getting yeah. too painful having all the books. <laughs> <laughs> well, on the same topic of, of books and everything. Um, next question is, do you have a favorite artist or writer, painter, pottery maker, ballet, dancer, anything in the arts that, uh, uh, and if so, what, what really draws you to that person? I, I know you have a bunch cause we've, we talk a lot about different yeah. arts and music and stuff. And it's something that you and I first connected on besides whiskey was that, you know, even though we don't have the exact same taste, we both have a lot in that artistic world that we're drawn to. And I, I'd, I'd love to know from you, like, wh what are your favorites? I mean, there's so many, of course, like you said, and also I'm not, I'm not a, like a narrow music listener or narrow, like uh, I, when I say narrow, let's just like, I listen to everything. I read everything. And if I go to a museum, I like to see any kind of art, like from classical era to contemporary to modern, whatever. But when you asked me this question, I was just like, wait a minute, like focus. I have to give him some <laughs> names. I cannot just like list 20 names there. So I chose Jean Cocteau, who is a, in 20s, 30s in Paris. He was a designer, film director, and painter, and writer. He did everything in art community that he could do. And that's the one name that I chose. The other one is Jean-Luc Godard as a film director from French New Wave. And the third one is just simply David Bowie. And, but I just like, I put those three names on top of each other when I was emailing you and I was just like, wait a minute, this is like a really odd, odd trio. Like, I don't know why I chose this name. <laughs> then I just realized these names just like made and produced things that made me look at art in a different way. They actually taught me like how art can be seen in a different way. For example, David, let's say David Bowie, you, you just got hooked into it because of the songs. And then you start to listen to lyrics and then the lyrics combines to another song. All of a sudden you start to see the connections, the things that he wears, the things that he just like puts on stage and all of a sudden it makes all the, oh my God, it's just like, he is the art, not right. like only the songs, like that you see the connection. Uh, all those three names were like more like mentors to me instead of me being a fanboy. They taught me a lot. They showed me things that encouraged me to search and look more into it and it just like forked into different things. Just, they were like great starting points for me. That's, that's amazing. And and thank you for answering the question I was gonna ask you is just why, why did you put them together? And that's, I mean, that makes sense. And that's so cool. And I mean, yeah, David Bowie, 
and he wasn't just lyrics and music it was yeah. a whole visual experience which is something when i when i go for live music something i love is when it's not just a band standing there playing their music and then they leave it, it's when it, it's this enveloping experience which is fine like the very first time i saw against me they were in this tiny little punk rock club and they just walked him and said we're gonna play till we're tired of playing we don't do encores and then we're going to tell you all to fuck off. And then they just played and played and played and played. And they got to the end. They're like, okay, we'll do a couple covers, throw out some names. And people were like, Ramones, Sex Pistols. And so they played a couple of Ramones covers. And they're like, tired, tired. Yep. All right. Fuck off. And then they just walked off the stage. <laughs> it was, they just <laughs> literally played till they're, and that's fun. But like when you have someone so expressive, like the David Bowie, who can put on this or like, uh, Chris, you and I, we were talking about Queen, like the way yeah. that they create something larger than the music when it's already incredible music is just, it's an incredible form of artistry just to see in itself. And also like it lives with you, like you like your teenager years and you listen to mm -hmm. it and you get like, you learn more, you experience more. It was like, oh, wait a minute, you go back. Like every 10 years, every decade, he meant something else to me. And also his every decade meant something else to me. Like his 70s, yeah. his 80s, in 90s. Like, That's incredible. And I mean, a great name to pick. He, he's definitely not lacking for inspiration. Um, moving from from that end of it, what about uh, movies uh, or books? Is, is there a favorite movie or book that you have? So again, I put like, I ask you not to use the or, but and, so I can at least choose like one you, movie and one book. You can do both. I this the the questions are free form. They're more as a, a point of thought, a, a start, thought, thought starter, if you will. So, please. Uh, and then I just like put those two names that I'm gonna tell you in a second. But I was just like, wait a minute. There, two of them are just like one is Austrian, the other one is German, and. So I just I have an explanation for it. I for a junior high and high school I was in a German school in Istanbul. So from after fifth grade all the way through the end of my twelfth grade, I was in, I was I was in a German education system, and but in Istanbul, and so I really got a sense of. German art a lot and and also learned German. So my favorite movie is uh, Wings of Desire from Wim Wenders. And my favorite book, I, I have to think about it a lot, but The Man Without Qualities from Robert Musil. So Wings of Desire, I don't know if you watched it or not, just mm -hmm. again, it's, it's just like it's like David Bowie influence. You watch, you think that you're going to watch a movie and after a while, it's like, whoa, 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 wait a minute, what's going on here? Just like there's poetry in there. There are just paintings that I, all the frames look like painting and the storyline is something else. There are like too many layers. It's just like going at the same time. And that that movie made me a Wim Wenders fan. And after that, like I actually watched everything that he directed. But his style is using the movie medium to present his art. It's not making movies. So mm -hmm. it just I, I I still go back and once in a while. It's just like Sometimes you want to go to a museum and going to look at a painting that you have seen a hundred times, but just looking at it makes you feel good. It's the same mm -hmm. thing for this movie for me. I can just like put it on and watch it every time. And it was just like, yeah, I know what it is. I've watched it like many times, but it just makes me feel good. That's that's amazing. My 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 feel good movie is so much more lowbrow. It's Starship Troopers. <laughs> that's my I love, love that movie. I, it was I think. It was so where I grew up in Wyoming, uh, when I was in high school, they were filming it in the desert in Wyoming, just 20 minutes outside of where I lived. Yeah. And so we would we'd see the trucks that we didn't know what was going on and everything. And then later the movie came out. But yeah, that was uh, it was filmed. It was filmed over in that area. But 
That's my that's my feel good movie. Way my, more <laughs> uh, No, I actually have a, my, one of my guilty pleasures is Michael Ironside. I'm a big oh. fan of that guy. So yeah, yeah. Oh, that's amazing. So I I've, I've never heard of until you sent me these answers. I'd never heard of the book, the movie, or the people behind it. But now they're definitely on my list because now I want to. Uh, I want to go experience them because they, they sound amazing, but yeah, I've never heard of them. So I'm, but I'm now I'm excited to at some point very soon. Um, switching back to your career, your life, your hobby, whatever, it's just something within Bozzy's life. I want to know what's an accomplishment that you are most proud of. I know there's probably a lot, but just what's something that you're, you're proud of accomplishing in, in, in Bozzy's life. To be honest, I'm going to go back to one of the earlier questions. When I left Istanbul to New York, I was so scared, like not, I mean, because it's starting from scratch again, like you don't have friends and you don't know where to eat. You don't know where to go to dance. You don't know where to grocery shop. You just find an apartment in a totally different city. And, but. Once you make it, once you go through, you feel like I can do it again and cannot wait to do it again. It's so, it makes you so feel good. I loved it. So after New York, okay, Istanbul, New York, then I had a Boston adventure for three years and then came here uh, in 2015. Yeah, 2015, I moved to Los Angeles. So. It's been four cities till now. And whenever I go somewhere and start from scratch and make new friends, that's, that's great. That's such a great feeling right now. The thing that I was most afraid of leaving my friends behind. Now I feel like that's the blessing of it. Now I have like friends in four different cities. That's amazing. Yeah. So I guess it has been six years because 2015 is when you moved here and 2015 is when yeah. we met and the 21. So yeah, it's been six years. Um, now we can put a stamp on it, but that's, that's incredible to be able to, to do that. It's something that I always, whenever I think of moving somewhere else that I always worry about is like, oh, am I going to be able to make friends? Especially as I get older, I get more crotchety. No, it's, that, that's, that's true too. Yeah. <laughs> so, when you get older, it's getting harder. And it it's is. not because of other people. It's because of myself. Yeah. Yeah. You don't want to like, ah, I don't want to expand my horizons anymore. I already did that. I'm <laughs> expanding. Um, and I'm assuming that for all those moves, it was your career that took you, right? Like for Boston, you went for, I don't know, Boston theater company or something. No, actually I accepted a teaching position at MIT. Oh. Uh, what? <laughs> this, but, is, this is new information. Bozzy taught at MIT? Yes, but in theater department. They have a theater department. I, wow. Okay. I didn't even know that MIT had a theater department. This is also, you're also an MIT teacher. <laughs> yeah. Three years. I thought that like they have a music theater arts department, which is mm -hmm. phenomenal because you have such a great pool of kids there. They're geniuses. And yeah. And they can achieve anything they want, including arts. That's so there was a new chair of amazing. MIT theater arts, and he was trying to change stuff, like it, make it like more contemporary. And he offered me the job to go there and basically teaching what the Wooster group does. So I we called it performing media. Mm -hmm. So I was actually teaching how to make performances with video sound and lighting and how to integrate it, not as a, as a part of the actual performance. So, wow, that's Wooster, MIT, UCLA. Yeah. You, <laughs> you might know a thing or two about this, this, uh, this, this category. Holy cow. That's amazing. Well, on, on that note though, um, if you had to give up your current career, and you had the resources and time to start over and pursue any career you wanted, anything you wanted, what would you do? So in years, it got a little more obsessive, but I'm a big history buff. Like 
I watch and read a lot of history. And yeah, I would love to go back and be a historian or archaeologist or a museum curator that actually based on history. That's amazing. That's so cool. That that's a, another layer of depth. I mean, when we talk, you I mean you, you're always be able to throw in these like historical anecdotes about different things. So I've I've always <laughs> thought that you had that, but I didn't know that you were such a, a deep history buff. Which I guess you know that leads into the next question, which is you know what 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 are your hobbies or obsessions or collections that, that are beyond the booze world? And I, I'm I'm assuming this has something that it's all tied together. Then. Yeah, I'm reading a lot of history, like non-fiction, uh, non-fiction history, and and from all kind of like eras. I'm not like focusing like sometimes just like ancient Egypt, sometimes uh, World War Two, sometimes a uh, Cold War era. But I'm really interested in those just kind of all across the yeah. across the board on all of it. That's amazing. And also, I'm a big crime fiction guy. Like I, when I read fiction. Besides all the other fiction, just like I'm really like following a few writers that contemporary writers writing crime fiction. And there is a genre, subgenre, they call Tartan Noir. And it's, <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> it's Scottish uh, so crime sorry. writers. Scottish crimes? <laughs> That's amazing. I mean, of course, it started after I got interested in whiskey. Yeah. And because I started to visit all the Scottish towns and cities a lot, and I was mm-hmm. just like interested to find things written about those towns. And I found myself in this little weird genre called Tartan Noir. <laughs> That's so, I, I didn't even know that existed. That's amazing. <laughs> Me I, I, know, like, like, 10 years ago, I figured it out. Like, have any of the murders in, in the stories that you read actually happen in distilleries? Uh, they are mentioning some distilleries, but not really. Oh, they, I, see, there's an opportunity. They, they need to have, like, I don't know, uh, the, mur- the murder in McAllen or something. Like, there needs to... Actually, there is a guy called Denzel Merrick. And he writes crime fiction happening in Campbelltown. And he was doing, he, he released his 10th book or something. He was doing it like for a long, long time. But Campbelltown is a small place. Of course, Very small, yeah. when he's talking about, he's talking about Springbank, Glen Scotia and stuff. And, but then he sold the rights finally. Now it's going to be a, like a, a TV show. Probably we're going to see a lot of Campbelltown there. So wow. Campbelltown folks were really excited about it. Yeah. That's so cool. Um, one of my, I just discovered that during right at the, the beginning of this year, one of my favorite English authors, Terry Pratchett, oh, his yeah. hit um, his series, the Watch series, which is I, I love that whole series of books with uh, of the Watch. That just became a show, which I it was on BBC, which I had no clue, and I just discovered this like two weeks ago. I was sitting there, I was re- I'm reading um, Feet of Clay, which is I think the fourth book in the series. And I just was randomly like, I wonder if anyone has ever turned this into like a movie or a TV series because the characters are so great. Everything's and I looked it up and yeah, they, they just launched it. And but of course, I got to. Yeah, Brits start. are really into it. Like we had like three different Bye. streaming services that to gather all those like the British dramas. <laughs> I'm, yeah, I have to, I just I end up like buying them like, all right, I'll pay the 30 bucks for the whole season and just watch okay. it on on Amazon. That's what I end up doing. So. <laughs> But it was, uh, I wish I need like, like, like a BBC prime or a BBC plus where I can just like get all like BBC one, two, three, four, whatever it is, like the whole package. And just... oh, I'll, I'll give you some hints about streaming services. There's something called Britbox that we are a big fan of. Yeah. Oh, see, that'd be better than me spending 30 bucks each time I want to get a grab a series. So, all right, I'll, yeah. I'll, no, I'll, I'll take you up on that right <laughs> after this. <laughs> So, all right. Moving to the next question. Um, we're doing this on a Saturday night, uh, doing this this interview. But let's talk about last night. What what does a typical Friday night in the Bazi household look like? So, I mean, things have changed after COVID and everything. But Friday night will be most likely a night that I will be working. 
because I'm in the performing arts. So Friday and Saturday nights are the nights that we are always doing something. So it's, things have changed, of course. And also like in low season, sometimes we are not having shows, but Teresa, my partner and I, we are big fan of neighborhood watering holes that serves food. Like wherever we go, like sometimes even we choose the neighborhoods. I was like, wait a minute, like, let's see, like, what's around it like is there any place that we can go like walking distance and don't we don't have to drive so here where we live right now in playa del california like our favorite place is the shack uh it's a kind of a divey surf bar that serves amazing food so if i'm not working my typical and also favorite Friday night will be going to the shack at early time, like maybe six ish mm -hmm. and ordering my pint of beer, chatting with the people at the counter. And it has to be at the counter. I hate just like being on a table or something. So, and staring at the, whatever is on the TV, it can be some time. It's a Seinfeld episode. Sometimes it's a, American football game, who knows what it is like, and, yeah, and drinking beer and chatting with people around you, like, actually, after a month or two, you start to know everybody, actually. That's and, and then, yeah, I go there like early, wait for Teresa to come. When she comes, we order our food, we drink a little more and chat with the bartenders whenever it gets like crowded because of Friday night and mm -hmm. our age is little bit like past that time <laughs> if it is at 10 p.m and stuff and it starts to we have like 20 year olds around we were like okay asking to check and going back home having our espressos and sleep because, uh, actually because i really started to value my mornings mm -hmm. so i really don't want to stay out late so i can wake up early that's amazing that's it's funny like in I, I used to be a, I'm, you know, especially during the pandemic, I wanted to get up like 30 minutes before I had to be to work, just like get up in time to go like walk the dogs, come back, get a cup of coffee and, and get on to work. But in the last, since like November, I've started going to bed around like 10 and 30 ish and then getting up at six. And I love having that 6 a.m. wake up and like watching the sunrise up over the ridge and over the trees up here. And like uh, you're in the best I, place for that. Yeah. I do have a good view for the, yeah, the, the, the sun comes up right in front of my house, like right up over the valley. It's, it's amazing. But I've really in the last spend a month and a half, I've, I've really enjoyed having that morning time. So I, I understand what you're talking about now. Like I, yeah, it's, there's something just nice about it and peaceful. Like, yeah, it's exactly like, I don't know. Like I was just like, Oh, like how did I waste all those mornings till I was, I don't know, 35. <laughs> I, until I was 40 <laughs> I wasted all those mornings until I was 40. And now I'm kind of like, I really am digging like that morning time. Um, someone that some, someone that what actually got me to do it is there's a, um, a, a he's a, um, not see now I can all I can think of as MIT. Cause I'm still blown away that Bozzi was an MIT <laughs> professor. Um, a Stanford. So he's a, a Stanford, professor of neurobiology and ophthalmology. His name is Andrew Huberman. And he does this podcast series, which you can get on like YouTube that he goes through the actual science of like mornings and evenings, and like how it actually affects our brains and, and the way that it works. Um, like the, the differences in light quality at morning and at sun or like sunrise and sunset and what it actually does to our circadian rhythm. And it's just, it's fascinating stuff. So yeah. If you're looking for like a really cool science podcast to listen to where the guy and he has a bunch of people that come in, but, you know, they're all like Stanford professionals. So, you, you know, he might know a thing or two being at that level. And uh, <laughs> I should definitely check it. It's it's amazing. Like, that's what I've been getting into is like really into like the science podcasts and like biology podcasts, and, like listening and like finding like, why do we behave the way we do? And like, why do things so? I love um, podcasts. That's my new thing. Yeah. I'm so like, 
obsessed with it. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I mean, I'll that, that, that's the one that's gotten me recently is, is Andrew Huberman's and I'll, I'll send you. OK, after. please. Yeah. Yeah. But um, during I mean, you just mentioned that after, you know, after a night of drinking and, and having fun at the bar at the shack with with Teresa, which did you meet Teresa in Boston? No, actually, in New York, she was York. the stage okay. manager of the Worcester Group. Although, okay, that, I, I knew there yeah. was something that I couldn't remember. Yeah. But yeah, and Teresa, by the way, is, uh, for those of you who have, have met her, she's phenomenal. She's a fantastic human as well. So the Bozzy teresa combo can't be beat. It, it's <laughs> it's amazing. I, I love the both of you. But um, you mentioned having espresso after your night, which is what I um, also enjoy, but... So that leads me to the next question is what is your favorite non-alcoholic drink? Definitely coffee and coffee, every yeah. form of coffee <laughs> and tea. So tea, okay. and Specific, like green tea, black tea, herbal tea. Like where are you at on that tea? So I, I don't know if you know the what? craziness of like tea obsession in Turkey, but you grow up with tea in Turkey. Like we, even if you go like shopping, if you go anywhere, you sit down, they, they're going to put tea in front of you, black tea, like a really plain black tea, but Turks are obsessed with tea. So I was already like tea in my DNA when I moved here. But of course, after I moved to New York, I started also like to find all the different kinds of teas. Now we have like probably 12, 15 different kinds of teas in our cupboard and we love coffee and tea. And I always think just like if something happens, and somebody's going to tell me, like, sorry, like, you cannot have alcohol anymore in your life. So I'll, I'll get obsessed with coffee and tea, probably. Nice. And, and I love water. Like, I like I drink water a lot. And I think that there are differences <laughs> between different. <laughs> I know it's just some people think that it's crazy. No, but... you're not. It's a different mineral quality. Like, I, I really like... Um, um, Shoot, now I'm blanking the name of it. It's that super heavy mineral water. You can get it at Trader Joe's, the German oh. one. Oh, okay, not the liquid that thing. No, no, no. I'm blanking the name of it. It's got a a white white and silver label, and I'm blanking the name on it. But it's like it, it, it's like known for being the heaviest mineral content uh -huh. in like a bottled water, and it comes in a glass bottle, and it's it's like it's metallic and sharp and bitter. It's so minerally and it's delicious. I and love I, it. I toured a lot with the Worcester group all over Europe and Asia and stuff. Like the first thing that I was so curious about, you go to a city and you want to taste the tap water. And I was like, because every city has a different taste and I love it. <laughs> and we were just like ranking the best water, like at the company, like who has the best water, like which city? <laughs> Oh my God. Bozzy's water blog. That's the next one. <laughs> I mean, I, my, my current water obsession, and it's mostly because of, I'm, I'm a little bit of a metal head. And so I, it's the liquid death. Like I love their marketing so much, but the water also tastes good. Like it's a good taste. So that's, that's my current water obsession. Otherwise it's Tapo Chico. Like that's, that's my, I love, I love Tapo Chico. That's, yeah. Oh. And and people were just like, oh, like they've been sold to Coca-Cola. We're not drinking Tapa Chico. It tastes the same. It's I the like same. it. Yeah. It's the same source. I, that's my favorite. It is hands down my favorite highball. Exactly. Water. Yeah. It's Tapa Chico. It, it just a little bit saltiness in it. And I yeah. love it. Yeah. That minerality in there. It's just wonderful. I love it. Yeah. And so that, that's all, all, all summer long when I'm making highballs like every night, like that's it's Tapa Chico. <laughs> I love it. It's my favorite. And I'm glad you like it too, Bozzy. <laughs> see, see now, now I feel validated because Bozzy likes it. So, oh. <laughs> um, all right. For the next question, switching out of uh, liquid, let's go to solids. That sounds weirder than I meant it to, but <laughs> I'm working on these transitions, man. This is really <laughs> the thing we're working. Um, there's no cuts in this, so whatever. <laughs> People just heard me say that. Um, what's the most memorable meal of your life? Because you, you had a great answer for the 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 drink, but now let's I want to switch gears. What what's a memorable meal from from your life? So that's an easy answer. When I saw this question, I knew what I'm going to answer. But this like I'm going to do an introduction first, like sure. When Please. we were going on tour, that's just like I think it's like early, not late two thousands. 
uh, we were upset. We were obsessed with no reservation with Teresa. So we had the, like the DVD set back in the time. There is no streaming. There were like DVD set of Anthony Burden's No Reservation. We watched everything. But when we were touring to a certain city, we were going back and watching that episode again and taking notes what to visit. So we were going to London on tour again and we watched the London episode. We took our like notes and we ended up in a restaurant called St. John. And, and it literally blew our minds. Like it is not a cheap restaurant, but it's not an expensive restaurant. It's not like a Michelin star restaurant. You walk in for the first time we walked in, and I was just like, is it the place? Because everything was just like whitewashed uh, walls, white cloth, the tablecloths, and wooden, very simple chairs and tables, nothing else. There's a blackboard, and there's a blackboard. They're just like, they have the menu on the blackboard and the drinks. And when somebody orders, for example, a meal and they're putting a line there because they don't have a lot, so they can run out. So they're counting how many servings and stuff. And that sent, that guy, uh, Fergus Henderson, and his partner, Trevor Gulliver, created that St. John restaurant. And the idea was maybe you are familiar with the book uh, From Tale to Nose. Mm -hmm. that he wrote about how to eat an animal, but everything. So you sit there and just like you order your food, they're serving it. Nothing else is distracting you from the food. Food is the only thing you see and taste. And we were like, we were in heaven. Like the first time I still remember and everything was so good. So I told you before, just like when it, good food makes me cry. And it was just like, we were like, oh my God, this is like, like, like a, like Almodovar movie, which is like, oh, it's so good. Like you were like tearing up. And now after that, we, every time we go to London for us, it is a must. And I admit sometimes we edit a day to our London layovers whenever we could just to visit that restaurant. Oh. And it's phenomenal, never changed, still the same, same decor. Food is changing every day because whatever it's available, they're just like changing it. But I ate so many memorable uh, meat, yeah, dishes there. And also their bar is nothing fancy. They have like Negroni, Manhattan, Martini. Like you cannot even just like ask any fancy cocktails and stuff, but everything is just like their food. That's so precise, so good, but so simple. Love it. Oh, that's amazing. <clears throat> I, that's, it's on my list. Like I want, I, it is now anyways. You know, I was supposed to go to London. I used to go to London uh, every six months for yeah, work. Yeah, you were, yeah. And, and I had never been. And, but now if I ever get back there, it, that, that is absolutely on my list. Like I want to try that place so, so bad, but that, and that just sounds amazing. It also reminds me a little bit of my favorite LA restaurant, which is Tua Mech, where you, you, oh, yeah. you, you go in and like you, you pay your, you pay for your ticket ahead of time. Then you go in and you just eat whatever Ludo's making that yeah. night. Like you don't have a choice. Like you just. This is just what you're eating tonight. And it's constantly changing. And every time you go in, it's different, but it's it's always just incredible. Yeah. Like, it's just a great experience. And uh, I wanna I definitely wanna go try that one. I'm I'm gonna get next time I actually get to go to London, I'm definitely gonna go on like a Bozzi's recommended <laughs> eating tour because you're you uh one of the the gin bars you recommended I went to yeah. when I was there last time, and that was fun. That was amazing. Like they, they, they had a big blackboard. They had just like all the different gins, and they had like the house um, drinks up there. And then they did their own like gin re infusions and different things. And like ended up uh, needing to uh, 
get a, a taxi back to the, the hotel because <laughs> I couldn't remember where, which direction I needed to walk. <laughs> it, was, it was a lot of fun. It was a very, very fun gin bar. But um, I know that you're a big music fan. It's something we've talked about a lot. And, and I know we're like whiplashing back and forth out of different categories. And I'm hoping that it has the effect of what I want of trying to like keep 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 your mind moving um, through here instead of focusing on like arts, food, drink, and, and going back and forth. So hopefully this this concept works, but we're going to go back to music now. And I, I would love to know you as just such a massive music fan, two openers, one headliner, what is Bozzi's dream concert? And again, I couldn't give you one answer. And I asked, like, can I have... I, I, I love how you're like, I need more answers than one on, on just about everything. And, I'm, and, I, and I love it, too, because it, it shows the, the complexity of, of just who you are. So please, give me, give, and, me, give me both answers. Okay, I asked, like, one jazz concert, one rock concert. So and I said, jazz concert... Dexter Gordon and Return to Forever opening for Miles Davis Quintet from the 50s, who like John Coltrane was a part of it too. So that's my dream concert for jazz. For rock, my people who know me know that I have one big guilty pleasure, <laughs> which is Oasis. <laughs> and Oasis and Frank Zappa opening for David Bowie. But I felt so bad when I put that bill there. I was just like, I couldn't fit the band. The band is actually my favorite band in the world. But I was just like, ah, they cannot be a part of this thing. <laughs> let, <laughs> let them do their own concert. Like, this is the festival lineup. We'll have their own separate Bozzy Dream concert with the yes. band. And Oh man, that would be a great show though. Oasis opening with Frank Zappa. And so who would go first? Oasis or Zappa? Uh Oasis. Oasis first. Frank, Frank Zappa. Zappa has the seniority. That yeah. that's fair. That's fair. Yeah. He's the elder statesman in, in that group. And then of course Bowie has to be yeah. the headliner. That would it would be it would be weird to have anything else. <laughs> <laughs> so in Getting into, you know, we've talked about food and drink and concerts and and, and careers. Um, let's talk about nothing. Bozzy, if you had 30 days with absolutely nothing to do, an unlimited budget, someone gave you, you know, like a, an Amex black card and was like, you don't have to pay it off. What would be your dream vacation or travel itinerary or just what would you do for 30 days? It's funny when I started to travel for whiskey to Isla, Campbelltown, and other places, I started to get so interested in Scottish islands, regardless if they have this tourist or not, because I fell in love with that thing. Like, mm -hmm. and we went to Orkney also, and all of a sudden you go to Orkney and you have two distilleries. And I was, after a while, I was like, yeah, forget about the distilleries. We know the whiskey. Let's go for just like discover the island. So for almost three, four years, I have like paperwork. We are planning an outer Hebrides tour. Oh, that'd be fun. And, but it didn't happen. First, we didn't have money. <laughs> and then COVID happened when we had money. Then we ran out of money again. <laughs> so it's still in progress. We're going to make it yeah. one summer. But uh, because you said unlimited money, I extended that outer Hebrides tour a little bit from Outer Hebrides to Shetland which and Faroe Islands. And okay. then since we ended up there, I wouldn't mind to go Iceland, Greenland, and jumping to Canada, to Newfoundland and Nova Scotia. Wow. So that will be, I mean, oh, I, I'm not a boat guy, by the way. I'm not planning to, I, I'm not a, thinking of using a boat or something flying is fine but these are the points that i really want to see well and, and with a with a with you know like a, a visa black card you don't have to pay back you can pay for you can just charter your own little puddle jumper just to take yeah, you from exactly. island island that's amazing i i want to go on your trip with you that sounds <laughs> just throw me in the back i don't you you and Teresa <laughs> sit up front <laughs> like that sounds 
that honestly sounds like an amazing trip. I would love to do the same. Oh, I'm so sorry you didn't get to do it, but man, that sounds like so much fun. I'm excited for when you get to do it because that's that's. I mean, uh, of course, it's not going to be that extensive. Yeah, but like yeah. we are still thinking out of hybridism and further islands. Like, oh I'm, my god. I'm following so many Instagram accounts from Faroe Islands. You're not going to believe it. Just, just to say, it's just started to be an obsession. <laughs> That's uh, you have to show me some time or send me some, send, send me some of them to look at. I, yeah, definitely. I got really into the uh, cabin porn when, once I bought my cabin and moved here. So there's a bunch of like uh, Instagram handles, all of like cabins and cabin ideas that I, I started getting into. So there, I get there's a There's a book called cabin there's, porn. Oh, really? Uh, I'm yeah. not surprised. <laughs> we got rule 42 of the internet. Once you think about it, it's already happened. Uh, all right. Well, we're hitting the end here, Bozzy. Okay. This has been an absolutely great time. I have learned so much about you. And this oh, has been you. an insanely fun hour. I can't even believe an hour has gone by already. This is It's nuts. But this has been an insanely, insanely fun time. So before we go, this is a very standard question, but... I absolutely love it's it's always my favorite part of any interview that I watch is because it's a question that is that really informs a lot about that person and where they come from. But what's the best piece of advice you've been given life, career, whatever it is that you'd like to share with other people? Uh, to be honest, like I didn't study my profession. I studied completely something different else but i because i was just like a performing arts lover i wanted to be a part of it and i jumped into it that's why my whole career is based on people's advices so there's so many that i noted down to shape my career and i didn't want to choose one of them because i didn't want to i didn't not to mention somebody else so instead it's going to be a little cheesy, but I'm a big Joseph Campbell fan. No. And Joseph Campbell has a really famous quote that it's everywhere. It's, you can even see it like in people's, like as posters and stuff. It's follow your bliss. Mm -hmm. He mentioned it in many interviews before he passed away and stuff like, but because I was such a fan, it really spoke to me. And it's a piece of advice that whenever you want to choose between A and B in your life, it helps. And that's how I ended up leaving Istanbul and going to New York and taking that risk. That's how I felt like my time with the Worcester Group was done and moved to Boston. And after that came here and all the other stuff too. Like whenever I have to choose between two things and Whenever I end up choosing between A and B, it's because actually you want one more than the other, but the other one feels always safer. Mm -hmm. And whenever you think just like, what will Joseph Campbell say? <laughs> follow, follow your bliss. I was like, okay, then we are going to the unsafe. <laughs> That's amazing. I love that. Thank you so much for that, Bozzi. And thank you for the, this this whole hour. Like this has been um just fantastic i know that i've gained a lot out of this of getting to know you better and oh, that was so much I, fun thank I, you and thank you and i hope i hope everyone viewing this and and reading the blog and everything that you you got to know bozzy better so please check out bozzy's blog tier bouchon it'll be linked in the in the um description below and also on, on the website but he's a fantastic whiskey writer he's oh, uh, obviously just a great human being and um I want to say cheers to you, Bozzy. Cheers to you, buddy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for the time. And anyone watching, if you have ideas, um, please um, support on the Patreon. And that's where we'll be voting on who we're going to have next in the list. You know, we've got a couple in the can already, but we've got going to have more uh, coming up. So, but um, yeah, like, subscribe, all that crap. And uh, thank you again, Bozzy. It, this thank has you. been just an absolute blast. Same here. Thank you very much. See you later, my friend. Bye.